Thank you. Namaste, everyone, for joining us on this webinar. Where we're going to reflect on the significance of the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. Our special guest today is Dr. Conrad Els, and of course, president of Hindu University of America, Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan. And uh, give some background. Uh, thank you for putting in the chat where you're zooming in from. But we've seen in this last news cycle, and depending on what you're seeing from which sources, it is uh, a celebration or doomsday. You know, there's so many different ways that people are interpreting it. Uh, we're going to reflect, we're going to have a deep conversation because it's been 500 years since we've been trying to, or Hindus have been trying to reclaim this sacred space that Bhagavan Sri Rama was born. And so we're going to discuss the centuries long struggle. We're going to talk about what's going on in the media. We'll take your questions and we'll get into all of these details. Let me give our First guest, our special guest, Dr. Conrad Elst, a quick introduction. Um, he's from, uh, he studied at KU Leuven. He obtained a MA degrees in Sinology, Indology, and Philosophy. Uh, he did a research stay at Banaras Hindu University. He did original field work for a doctorate on Hindu nationalism. You got magna cum laude. Back in 1998, uh, you know, this Hindu nationalism movement and the idea Conrad Ellis, Dr. Ellis has been at the, at the heart, at the intellectual arrow point, right? Like leading the charge, talking about it in this modern era. He's an independent researcher here in laurels and ostracism with his findings on hot items like Islam, multiculturalism, and the secular state, the roots of Indo-European, the Yodhya temple, mosque dispute. And so he's not afraid of saying the facts, doing the research, presenting from uh, a perspective that's objective, and also um, engaging with universities and uh, debates like Hindu University of America. So we're glad to have him on today. And of course, our other guest is uh, president of HUA Shrikalan Vishwanathan, president of Hindu University of America, leading the this visionary institution and initiative since 2018. Uh, his 21 year association of Puja Dayananda Saraswati of uh, the Arsha Vidya Gurukulam has really uh, given him direction, focus, and, and put him into this place. So his uh, previous career with Tata Consultancy, uh, he very accomplished, and we're glad that he's taken over and leading at Hindu University of America. It's my pleasure to introduce Goyan Vishwanathan and Dr. Conrad Els for today's webinar. And I'm sorry to say Dr. David Frawley is not going to be able to join us today. Devi Dattaji, uh, Dr. Mahapatra, uh, one of our core faculty, asking him, I apologize for that, but um, technical difficulties. But we do have Conrad Elst and Kayanji, so I'm going to hand it oh. off. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you all and namaste, everybody. Uh, da David Frawley just uh, wrote me an email a, uh, a few minutes ago uh, saying that uh, He's at a place in Delhi. He's also in Delhi, by the way, where Conrad is. Uh, he just landed there, but he's in a place where the internet connection is not so great, and he apologized for not being able to join today. So the conversation will be today anchored by Dr. Conrad Elst, uh, primarily. Okay, so first of all, uh, Dr. Elst, I'm very grateful for your uh, willingness to join uh, and uh, very ready to your readiness to participate in this conversation i really really appreciate it <clears throat> and uh, i want to start today by uh, just uh, positioning uh, dr conrad elst as a belgian scholar uh, he had a ringside view of the very early days of this ram janmabhoomi movement uh, and he had a, an opportunity to document uh, some of the historical events associated with this movement. Uh, he had a chance to interact and participate with people like uh, Sitaram Goel and uh, Ram Swaroop. <clears throat> By the way, both of them have Ram in their names, <laughs> coincidentally, <laughs> right? And uh, I want to begin, uh, Dr. Elst, uh, uh, by asking you a question, C can you uh, recollect uh, your involvement uh, with this whole movement from the very earliest days when you first got acquainted with it? Uh, and tell us a little bit about your personal history with the movement. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. And um, 
Yes, its uh, story starts in um, Darya Ganj, the uh, publisher's area of Delhi, where I, um, you know, did some reconnaissance during the few days I had to stay in Delhi because I had to do some paperwork at the embassy. And I found a book, um, History of Hindu Christian Encounters by Sitaram Goel. I read it in one go. And so the next day I went back to this uh, bookseller, Mr. Upal. And he said, well, actually, if you like the book, you might as well talk to the writer. He lives just down the block. And so he telephoned immediately and arranged an appointment for me. And so I spent the afternoon talking with Sitaram Goel. And, um, you know, he knew the, the whole background of the Hindu movement, of course, and uh, which he explained to me. I had gone to the um, bookshop of the RSS on Jan de Valan the day before um, the uh, Suruchi Prakashan. And I was not too impressed with what I saw there. It was the standard nationalism that you will find in, in other countries also. I mean, we had this idea, okay, we now know Christian and Islamic fundamentalism. Hinduism being a very colorful religion, its own form of uh, militancy will therefore also be very original and colorful. But what I found was a pretty standard kind of uh, militancy. And so what um, Sitaram Goel gave me to understand was far more complex and far deeper, going far deeper into the past, far more connected with the specificities of Hindu philosophy. So I was really impressed. Then he also gave me the detail about the Ayodhya movement, which I somewhat knew. I had been reading the papers, including the communist fortnightly frontline, where there had been a big discussion between two wings of the so-called secularists. And so you found that, um, and this was a debate about the then um, very newsworthy ban of Salma Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, which offended uh, Muslims to some extent. And so it turned out that uh, one uh, Muslim leader, Syed Shahabuddin, had announced a Muslim march on Ayodhya to coincide with a uh, Hindu festival there. And Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi thought, well, this is a surefire formula for a bloodbath. So he invited Chabun and said, OK, we want you to call off this march. What do you want in return? And so uh, he included among his demands was the banning of the Rushdie book. So there was a debate about this. And the, the hard secularists, principally the communists, uh, at that time, were against religious obscurantism, not only from the Hindu side, also from the Muslim side. So they thought that uh, criticism of religion should, of course, be allowed. In fact, it is Karl Marx himself who said that criticism of religion is the beginning of any criticism. Yet, the, uh, the soft secularists, principally the Congressites, like uh, Hushwan Singh and like uh, MJ Akbar, and today is with the BJP. At that time, he was the principal ideologue of Congress. They invented com you know, complicated reasons why somehow uh, freedom of speech was compatible with the ban on this book and why secularism uh, implied appeasement of the minorities. Anyway, so this was a very interesting debate and a bit of a surprise to me because I thought that secularism meant secularism, which means the, uh, the, the, the separation of church and state 
implying, of course, the right to criticize religion. Uh, so that turned out not to be the case. But the interesting takeaway was that the Ruzi affair was rooted in the Ayodhya affair. So this is one of the several international ramifications of the Ayodhya affair. So then when I talked to Sitaram Goel, I started understanding where, where this whole affair came from. And uh, in fact, I came away with the decision, I'm going to research this more closely and write a book about it. So Goel G smiled internally and thought nothing will come of it. But a few months later, the manuscript was ready. And in fact, it's he himself who published it. So that's um, the answer to your question. You see, that's how it started for me. Which which year was that, uh, Dr. Conrad? Uh, yes, a very elementary question. So 1989, 1990. Okay, that was just before, that when the moment was really gathering strength, right? Yes. Yeah, great, terrific. Now, uh, so the book that you uh, created, you published uh, around that time, what, what is the name of that book? That's um, Ramdan of Humi versus Babri Masjid, a case study in Hindu Muslim conflict. Yeah. It, it's not an important book, it's just a fair, you know, essentially a journalistic overview of the events that made up the affair and the arguments that were being given at that time, which to me were enough to conclude, well, of course there was a temple there. Mm -hmm. And so until a few years before, that would not have been controversial. Mm -hmm. That was the opinion of everyone included. I mean, included the, um, the local Muslims. Like in 1885, there had been a trial about it where all parties concerned agreed that, yes, this temple was built, uh, this mosque was built on a destroyed temple. But the judge at that time concluded, well, you know, it's it's already long ago. Let's uh, keep the status quo. But uh, at any rate, um, in 1989, this had become very controversial. Yeah. There had been a statement by the JNU historians that there was effectively no temple and that uh, the situation there should be frozen and certainly no temple should be built. Right. And so then, then a controversy erupted. You see, until then, uh, of course, it had been expected that the Muslims wouldn't like it, but the Rajiv Gandhi government was steering towards building the temple by giving certain sweeteners to the Muslim side, like, for instance, the Shabano law, which restored the Sharia, the Islamic law system, as the basis for Islamic divorce and alimony law. So that overruled the existing compromise with modern notions of uh, sexual equality and uh, feminism. And so it was a very regressive law. And so the left, the communists and so on, didn't like it at all. But you see, Rajiv Gandhi justified it to himself as necessary in the context of a larger compromise between Hindus and Muslims, which included building the temple for uh, the Hindu side. And at that time, he thought he could get away with it because it was not a big affair yet. He saw it as, as the usual... Congress side horse trading. And so normally, you know, on the understanding that, of course, there had been a temple there, uh, he could have steered towards rebuilding, you know, or building a new temple. Right. However, in uh, 1989, it became a, a hot potato, and most middle of the road politicians became too shy to pursue it. Although even in 1989, November 1989, the um, the Shilanias took place in the presence of the Home Minister Bhuta Singh. So the Congress government was still very much in support of building the temple. It's important to say this because today many people say, oh, the Congress is absolutely against the temple and it has always been against the temple. 
Well, that's not entirely true. Today, it is a question, you see, suppose Congress had been in power and the Supreme Court had awarded the side to the Hindus, would perhaps, out of appeasement for the minorities, the Congress somehow have found a way to sabotage the implementation of this verdict. And, you know, this is being alleged by the BJP side. I doubt it, but it's not entirely impossible. However, back then, uh, the Congress was a different party. Back then, you see, they also cared for their Hindu vote bank. And so they were willing to, you know, come to some kind of compromise, which also took care of their Hindu support base. Right. And so today, there is not much of a Hindu support base anymore. They lean far more on the minorities than they used to. But back then, Rajiv Gandhi, as well as his successor, um, Nara Singh Rao, still worked towards building the temple. Right. So, Conrad, I want to uh, go back to an observation you just made, which is that uh, up to around 1989, there was a consensus in uh, in India that there indeed was a temple on whose ruins uh, the mosque, the Babri Masjid had been built. But then suddenly that was disputed and, and, and there were claims being made that there never ever was a temple there, right? I mean, in today, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I just listened uh, just a, a few hours ago. In fact, uh, a, a video in which uh, which featured uh, Audrey Trusky from uh, I don't know where she's teaching nowadays, uh, Harvard maybe, <clears throat> uh, or Rutgers, Rutgers probably. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, the, the in the whole video, which lasted about fifteen minutes, you know, she never mentioned. That there was a temple uh, on whose uh, ruins the mosque was, the Babri Masjid was built. She mm -hmm. avoided, that. but she emphasized that the the fact that a mosque was torn down in order to make space for the Hindu temple, right? So yes. That, so the dispute, you know, I want to go back to the origins of the dispute when people started saying there never ever was a temple. Uh, under that mosque, and and that created comp uh, a lot of uh, uh, ongoing uh, heartache and complexity. So, what triggered that particular uh, stand, and who took it? Who are the key players in that uh, in that occasion? Well, um, what uh, Audrey Trushkin now does is what uh, the last diehards of the anti-temple movement do in India they can hardly deny the evidence now. You see, the documentary evidence was brought together in 1991, uh, presented by a group of scholars, and it fell to Voice of India, which is to uh, Sitaram Goel, who ultimately entrusted the task to myself to string together all the pieces of evidence into a coherent narrative, which was published at the time under the title Hindu, um, uh, uh, history versus casual history. Hmm. So um, that's the, the, the documentary evidence. Then the archaeological evidence also left no doubt at all. It started in the 70s with Bibi Lal. Among his team was also K.K. Mohammed, who is still alive, oh. uh, who had been invited, in fact, to the Prana Pratishtha in Ayodhya, I couldn't go for health reasons. But so, I mean, his contribution is very much recognized. Then during the demolition in 1992, many important archeological pieces came to light, including uh, an inscription which said in so many words that this was a temple for Rama, or at least for the incarnation of Vishnu that killed uh, Ravana and uh, Bali. So then the, the third uh, part of the archaeological evidence is the official court ordered excavations of 2003, where again KK Mohammed participated. And um, so there the, the pillar bases and so on 
I mean, at that time, the, the, the mosque itself was not standing in the way anymore. So the whole terrain was, uh, was excavated. And the, uh, the pillar bases and many temple pieces came to light. And then the fourth time, it, you know, it was a case of serendipity of finding something that you weren't looking for. This was during the preparation for building the new temple in 2020. So when a building company starts to build something, first they have to dig a big hole. And you see when this happens, whenever this happens in some old city, the archaeologists come flocking, you know, even though the digging will not happen according to the, you know, standard methodology of archaeology, still, you know, if if any pieces come to light, it's it's useful for the archaeologists. So then again, a number of temple remains were found. So the archaeological evidence is absolutely conclusive. Of course, there was a temple there. So right now in India, no one informed or no one who has a reputation to defend as a historian or an archaeologist is going to openly deny that there was a temple there. However, uh, all the parties and people, and this includes Audrey Trushke, have now retreated to a second line of defense, namely to simply not mention that there was a temple there. Yeah. So you see, now they all say, oh, the temple is built on an ancient mosque. Now this ancient, you know, evokes images of uh, ancient, like really imposing uh, constructions like Ajanta and Elora, like the Minakshi temple and so on. Or, you know, in foreign countries, the Acropolis in Greece or so, you know, something really impressive, imposing, that would be really a shame to destroy. In fact, you know, the, 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 the Babri Masjid, I've seen it myself back in 1989, was a very pedestrian mosque. I mean, even among mosque architecture, it was a very ordinary building. You know, nothing is lost with this demolition. And so what they never refer to is that that mosque itself was built on an earlier temple. Right. At least at least we should appreciate that Audrey Trushke apparently deplores the destruction of places of worship, you know, by by deploring the destruction of the Babri Masjid. At least, you know, she concedes that principle. So if she takes that principle serious, she should absolutely dislike the Bavari Masjid because that itself was built on an earlier place of worship. Right. And so that earlier place of worship, I mean, we should remind her of that. And, you know, then the issue becomes very clear again. Right. So, uh, Conrad, I, I want to move to the, uh, to the very important work that uh, Sitaram Goel then published called the, the Hindu temples, what happened to them uh, in two volumes. There was a volume one and a volume yes. two. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd like you to reflect on, uh, you know, the, the, what led to those, uh, the, those books, you know, uh, and uh, how those books emerged uh, during that era of uh, sort of the, uh, how the, how the yes. controversy kind of triggered uh, Sitaram Goel writing those books. Right. So these two volumes are about two related topics. Volume one is a, a list of 1862 uh, destroyed temples, either transmuted into mosques or demolished and then replaced by mosques. And and, and uh, Kunda, so, you're saying eight when you say 1862, you're talking about 1,862 temples were listed in the volume. Yes, volume. yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, so that's a very scientific statement. You see, a scientific statement is supposed to be falsifiable. You know, you have to be able to uh, do a test 
that shows that what you say is true or not true. And in this case, it's very easy. You, you start with one of the 1862, and you show that it does not have a history of Hindu temple destruction. However, there is absolutely not one of these 1862 where this falsification succeeds. Indeed, it has been tried for only one temple by the American self-described Marxist historian Richard Eaton. And even that turned out to be wrong. Um, Sitaram Goel already takes care of that, that criticism in his book. And so for all the 1861 other temple mosques, it has not even been tried. But this is now 33 years ago. And we know that all these historians who, you know, try to laugh at this or, you know, saying it's an extremist concoction or whatever, not one of them have, has tried his heart at re refuting even one of those 1862 claims. And then the second part is about the reason why this happened. And so th that's that's more rare. You see, the um, very few people have a stomach for digesting this uh, this analysis of the Islamic theology of iconoclasm. But so that's that's detailed. First, there are historical precedents like Mahmoud Ghaznavi. Uh, who destroyed the Somna temple and the Krishna Janmabhumi temple, um, and whose nephew, by the way, Salar Masud Ghaznavi. You know, this is rarely mentioned, but in 1030, he was the first one to destroy the Ram Janmabhumi temple, right. which was then rebuilt and much larger. And then you get the temple of which we have the pillar bases. You know, the temple that has been dug up in 2003. But so um, then you have the ultimate precedent, which is Muhammad himself. And so Muhammad himself also destroyed pagan, you know, Arab polytheist places of worship. Uh, and especially the Kaaba. So the Kaaba, the, the main um, sacred place of Islam, used to house 360 murtis for every sect that was available in the Arab Peninsula, including Christianity. There were also Jesus and Mary statues. And so he destroyed them with his own hands. And when later Islamic iconoclasts try to justify what they're doing, this is the precedent that they invariably cite. So you see, all this is explained and analyzed in detail by uh, Sitaram Gowal. It's a pretty unique book. Mm. And um, fact, uh, it's, yes, in fact, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of underline what uh, Dr. Kondar else is saying, that these two volumes, Hindu temples, what happened to them, volume one and volume two, are uh, very important uh, books, the like of which probably were never written before his time. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, the only book that even comes close to what Dr. Sitaram Goel did was uh, uh, Meenakshi, Dr. Meenakshi Jain's book, The Flight of the Deities, that has come out yes. relatively recently. Uh, so I would encourage all the people in the audience to kind of find out and seek those books out. They are now available online via, uh, what is it, Voice of India, right? Voice of India. Probably. Yes, Voice of India. Yeah. Yeah, yeah back to you, Mundar. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe at this point I can uh, make a little publicity for books of my own. Please. So you find more evidence about the Ayodhya case and related cases. In my book from 2002, um, Ayodhya, the case against the temple. And mind you, this title may put you on the wrong foot because you might think, and hopefully many uh, candidate buyers have thought so, that this was a book against the temple. So hopefully many people who were against the temple 
<laughs> thinking that this was a book supporting their case, uh, have bought it and read it and changed their minds. I don't know. I hope so. Um, at any rate, the idea here is that in the debate, you had a case in favor of the temple. You see a number of scholars had you know, done the effort of collecting all the uh, documentary evidence that proved that there had been a temple there. The archaeologists, likewise, have done excavations and so on that proved the existence of the temple. Now, on the opposite side, there have been claims that there was no temple there, but there have been no proofs that there was no temple there. And in fact, there has not even been an attempt to prove that there was no temple there. And so that's what I'm drawing attention to with this title. Uh, I discuss it a little bit, you know, the, the psychology of the anti-temple historians, who at that time, uh, in the, the, the atmosphere of the enormous power of secularism in India, uh, thought they could marginalize the uh, pro-temple historians, you know, depict them as amateurs and, you know, extremists and having concocted this story and so on. And so they thought they could get away with this. And if you read the papers at the time, you would indeed get that impression because the papers were absolutely against the temple and highlighted everything that might so doubt. Hmm. So in interesting. Fact, uh, on, on that point, right, uh, Dr. Kumar, yeah. today if you read the narration about the rebuilding of the Hindu temple in Ayodhya, in the main yes. Western media, right, uh, Washington Post and New York Times and BBC and and Guardian and, and the Independent and so on, it's pretty much the same thing, right? It, it, it highlights how awful the Hindus were in, uh, uh, you know, building a temple on a site that was... Uh, uh, originally a very sacred mosque for the Muslims, but they mm -hmm. they quite they uh, they avoid mentioning the the destruction of the temple prior to the, yes. the mosque, and and so that style of uh, you know uh, reporting which you uh, just alluded to is in fact still continuing in the in the West, and, and that's one of the strange. Uh, yeah. Uh, remnants of this uh, this whole uh... yes and in fact in my next book which was just uh, last year mm. called Forever Ayodhya mm. um, I um, continue analyzing this uh, this tendency so in in the first book 2002 I already observed that uh, this Richard Eaton has developed this argument that uh, minimizes the temple destruction admits it to some extent, to some minimal extent, but then tries to uh, give explanations that shield Islam from criticism. Right. And so I, I have to unfortunately notice that this kind of uh, defense has become entrenched in the textbooks, has become generalized, yeah. and is now the usual defense. And so I, you know, document it more uh, in the later book uh, and also take more care to refute it from every angle. Namely, that yes, there was some Muslim temple destruction, but it is not the Muslims, but the Hindus who are to blame. See, that's more sophisticated. You know, they can't get away with simply denying it anymore but they managed to blame the Hindus. Yeah. Now, the reasoning is that there have been cases of uh, pagan kings who often worship the same gods, but nevertheless, in conflicts against one another, stole one another's uh, murtis. Effectively, in Mesopotamia, this is a fairly common occurrence that in some war between, let's say, the Sumerians and the Akkadians or whatever, the winning party abducts the main murti from the main temple of the losing party. And so in India, you have a few cases, only a few, but OK, let's admit, you know, yes, there are a few cases. But you see what happens there? 
the the losing party is you know robbed of its main murti and the main murti is taken away to the winner's capital installed there in the main temple consecrated by the priest and so what happens is that the same worship of the same god simply continues hmm. and in the loser's temple they have of course every freedom to sculpt a new murti to have it installed and consecrated and so the worship continues so what happens is only that let's say a shiva statue is being moved from one place to another but in both places the shiva worship simply continues mm -hmm. so in the religious landscape nothing changes you know only a material object is moved from place x to place y this is not at all what happens in Muslim iconoclasm, where, of course, Mahmoud Ghaznavi did not take the Shiva Lingam from the Soma temple all the way to Ghazni and install it there in his main mosque to worship it. Okay? What he did, on the contrary, was to destroy the Lingam and mason or the, the, the remaining pieces into the floor, you know, beneath the mosque so that Muslims would have the joy of trampling upon idols. Right. Moreover, there's another difference. It is absurd, if you know the, the sources somewhat, to think that Muslim rulers would imitate Hindu rulers. You see, there is not one case where one of these Muslim iconoclasts, like Aurangzeb, give the example of a Hindu ruler and say, oh, you see, I do this because the Hindu ruler also did it. That's absolutely non-existent. And I mean, why would people who think they have the true religion follow people whose religion they want to destroy because they consider it a false religion? Right. No. Whenever they try to justify their iconoclasm, they give Muslim precedents and especially the precedent of the Prophet's own behavior. Right, right, right. So, uh, you know, uh, going back to the book, uh, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them, uh, Sitaram Goel documented 1862, 1862 temples. Now, do you believe, Conrad, that he actually visited all these temples to gather evidence? How did he collect this uh, and, and assemble this data? In your your yeah, mind. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. No, that's all by local informers, or in many cases, you know, this is just public knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it needed to be brought together in one place so that you get an overview about how serious the problem is. Right. You see, in many cases, you have these um destroyed temples mentioned in in art history books about the Hindu temple, or specifically like the Hindu temple in Karnataka, or the Shiva temple, and so on. And you have descriptions of how, how the statue was built, what the structure of the building was, and so on. But it's only when you come to the section of the photographs that you see that there are only ruins, right. that there are only leftovers. So in many cases, it's very easy to come at this uh, historical evidence of what happened to the, the Hindu temples, but no issue was ever made of it under the Nehruvian regime. It was taboo to, uh, to, go to, to go to this subject. I mean, you see, for especially also the foreign audience, there was, of course, an interest in the history of the Hindu temple, but the part of that history, namely that so many temples were destroyed, was, to the extent possible, avoided. Mm -hmm. And so what Sitaram Goel did was to unearth all this information, bring it together, and draw attention to it. Right. But and, I agree, mm -hmm. I agree that his information was very incomplete. The list of 1862 is just the tip of an iceberg. Right. right. So there are many more. Yeah. Like, for instance, the state of Kerala, 
was relatively little affected by iconoclasm, mainly in just two periods, the rule by uh, Tipu Sultan uh, around 1800 and uh, the period of the Mopla rebellion in 1921. So there are comparatively few temple destructions in Kerala. He lists only two. And yet, uh, just a few years ago, a book has come out by this uh, Tirur Dinesh, uh, which lists hundreds of cases. Right. And in fact, it's only volume one. You know, more is to come. Just, uh, so, I mean, you know, just there are many Kerala. cases in the state of Kerala alone, oh. which, you know, he lists, which are many, many more than Sitaram Goel knew of. And so of many states in India, a similar book could be written. Right. So, uh, Conrad, you know, I, I have heard estimates, you know, and of course, the, these are estimates that the number of Hindu temples uh, destroyed uh, in uh, across the length and breadth of Bharat runs into somewhere in the range of 40,000 to 60,000 temples. Okay, now I don't know how these estimates are made and who is making them. But I just wanted your uh, your view of this uh, number that's been floating around for uh, some years. Well, ago. I mean, I, we know that there are many more. Like, um, if you simply take Aurangzeb's own record yeah. of the orders he himself gave for temple destruction, you already get more than these, uh, you know, two thousands of, of Goel's list. Mm -hmm. And you know, so there are many cases that we even don't know about that have not been documented. Yeah. Uh, so we know it's many, and uh, I mean, I won't hazard a guess, but it is very many, very many more. And in fact, uh, it is the the Muslim historians, uh, you know, who have documented the these destructions yes. much, much, much better than uh, Hindus have done, and and Hindus yes. uh, have avoided for some reason. And, and Sitaram Goel is an exception to this. Hindus have avoided sort of. You know, doing the hard work of mm -hmm. and documenting the the this list of this massive list of temples that were destroyed by under Islamic rule, about wave after wave after wave of Islamic rule in in uh, in India. Uh, I mean, have you have you studied some of these Muslim uh, works uh, in their uh, uh, either in their original or translations to kind of uncover some of these? Uh, Stories of what they well, yeah. Yes, I, I studied Persian, but that's only that's already 40 years ago. So mm -hmm. in the 90s, I used to study these works in the original. I mm -hmm. think now I couldn't do it anymore because I haven't practiced this for the last 20 years. Um, but I mean, these works are available, so you can study them like uh, Babar's diary, which incidentally. This is, in fact, not the best example, because when Babar came in India, there were very few Hindu temples. Right. So here and there, there were areas that had a certain autonomy because they managed to collaborate. It was a very uneasy relation. And so they, they managed to maintain a certain Hindu life within their own domains. Uh, but generally, there were very few uh, temples to destroy because it was the Sultanate regime until 1525, which was the most militantly iconoclastic regime in world history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in his fights against Hindus, you know, when he, when he makes these uh, mountains of skulls of Hindus that he killed, uh, you know, there's a lot of fanaticism. He also explicitly says that he's a jihadi, that he comes to uproot uh, paganism and so on. But temple destruction plays a very limited uh, role in this, simply because there weren't many temples to destroy. Mm -hmm. Hindu life had gone underground. Yeah. You know, they, they did what they did as unseen as possible. Right, 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 and and you wrote another important book in my mind, uh, uh, titled uh, "Negationism." Negationism. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, uh, can you share a little bit about uh, uh, 
uh, you know, what led you to writing that book? When did you write it? And, you know, what is the yes. scope of that book uh, itself, uh, Conrad? It must have been 1991, 92. And it is, it started as a review of Sitaram Goel's book. Hmm. And so, you see, then I made the comparison with a movement that was going strong at that moment, hmm. namely Holocaust negationism in Europe. Hmm. Now, um, then I studied some of the Holocaust negation and precisely to be able to make that comparison. So the word negationism was coined by a French sociologist in, I think, about eight, 1987. But it's a movement that started much earlier, and in France in particular, um, uh, already around 1950, by a few people who had been in the French resistance, then arrested and taken to a German concentration camp, which they survived, but where there were no gas chambers, <clears throat> because the gas chambers were concentrated in a few specific camps. And so the camps for resistors, for communists and so on, they didn't have these gas chambers. So these people said, okay, everything we hear in the media about gas chambers is not true because I was there and I haven't seen them. So this is a, you know, not very correct reasoning, but it's understandable. And so then gradually it was the more ideologized. It got an anti-Semitic uh, content and so on. And so by 1990, it was a big movement. And um, so then people started to analyze it. And so they call it in French, negationisme. So that's the term I use there. You know, you could say denialism. At any rate, it is the um, denial of historical genocides. Now, here I want to warn Hindus to be careful with the terms they use. Um, because of this comparison, I often hear, ah, the Hindu Holocaust. Now, that's a very dangerous term to use uh, because... Uh, first of all, it, even though the word Holocaust was first started for the Armenian genocide in the First World War, it has become, after the Second World War, more or less the standard term for the Jewish genocide uh, happening in World War II. And, you know, there are very few allies that the Hindus have had, you know, until now. And... The Israelis are especially, you know, your your favorite brothers. You know, they are the ones who are on your side in many of the international controversies. You know, they are against Christian missionaries. They are against Islamic terrorism and so on. So, you know, to undiplomatically offend them by stealing their, their term uh, is very unwise to do. More fundamentally, what happened to the Jews is not exactly the same as what happened to the Hindus. You see, in the Hindu case, the killing took place in an entire subcontinent and over a thousand years. That's why the numbers are much larger than in the case of the Jewish Holocaust, which happened only in Poland and Russia uh, in three, four years. Right, right. No, I understand. Nevertheless, that. nevertheless, in a sense, the Holocaust is the genocide par excellence because there the, the clear goal of the Germans, or, or at least that little minority in Germany that actually, you know, implemented the Holocaust uh, of the, the SS brigade, um, they had as an objective to kill every Jew. And so there was no escape. Like, for example, you had the famous case in the Netherlands of the nun Edith Stein. She was a convert from Judaism to Catholicism, yet she was arrested and, you know, taken to the, to the concentration camps. And they wanted to make it clear that there is no escape. You see, many Jews tried to escape by converting to Christianity. And so the Nazis were saying, well, you know, there's nothing you can do. You're going to die. Whereas in the case of Hindus, there was an escape possible. 
Of course, in the middle of a military conflict, there was not much you could do. There you really had to either win militarily or die. But generally, the goal of Islam was not to kill every pagan. You see, the goal of Islam was to convert you. Yeah. And this is said explicitly in the Quran, uh, war and hatred will uh, reign between you and me uh, until you accept Allah. Right. So the, <laughs> unlike the Nazis, for example, the Muslims explicitly um, uh, targeted world conquest. And so they wanted everyone to accept Islam or temporarily to at least submit to Islam, to accept a, a much lower position, you know, as dhimi, what they call dhimitude. You pay the jizya tax to the... Right. Uh, so tax. there was a sort of compromise that you didn't have to die. Right. And so that's a very fundamental difference with what happened in the Holocaust. That's why I would very much avoid the term Holocaust, even the term genocide. Mm. There is also a um, a practical reason why this should be done. If you want to draw attention to your own experience, you should not use a term that refers to somebody else's experience. Yeah, so the if is, you want to... Do the the point is well taken. Well take, yeah. But what happens to the Hindus, mm. you should you, you know choose some Sanskrit term and then propagate that. You know, like I heard um, the Hindu uh, Jagaruti Samiti, they use the term uh, Hindu Vancha Vichedana, the ex extirpation of the Hindu lineage. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to interfere <laughs> with this. You hmm. have to choose yourself which term. But so the way Holocaust is used, that way you should also select a Sanskrit term and then make this term and especially the historical reality that goes behind it known to everyone. Right. right. No, that's an excellent, excellent recommendation. Now, I mean, if we were to use an English word uh, and, and avoid, let's say we avoid the words Holocaust and genocide as you are recommending, uh, do you think there is an an English word that would be more appropriate uh, in your opinion, Dr. Conrad? An English word? Well, I mean, let's start with Hindu massacre or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> there are several words that, you know, describe a large scale killing, yeah. which did happen, right. but which is not the same thing as genocide. Yeah. Now, there was an author somewhere during this period uh, who went on to est make an estimate of the uh, number of Hindus who who died or the population, how the population yes. went down over 500, 600 years of Islamic rule in India. Do, do you recollect that author, uh, Dr. Kondra? Yeah, yeah, of course, it was K.S. K. K. Lal, I knew him. K.S. Lal. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, all, all the historians... You know, who collected the evidence have unfortunately died. So yeah. <clears throat> I've gone to the um, the Prana Pratishta, the inauguration of the new Rama temple, explicitly to carry the flag for all the scholars who are no longer with us to to attend the uh, the occasion. Yeah. But so he was one of them, K. S. Lal, uh, Kishori Sharan Lal, mm. and it is in 1979 that he published a book in which he uh, made a case that uh, from the evolving demography of India, 80 to 100 million people were missing uh, by 1525. Right. Now, whether they were all killed, that's a different question. You have, first of all, millions who were uh, exported as slaves mm. to Central Asia or to Iran. Then you um, have the uh, chaos that followed in the uh, agricultural system, which caused famines. So you have, you know, so-called collateral damage of, again, millions of people who disappear. But then you also have millions who were actually killed. And, you know, how many of each category? Well, that's 
that's a subject for historical research. Mm -hmm. But so the atmosphere was very much against this research. I mean, the whole idea that there was killing of Hindus by Muslims is a big taboo. And so that research has never been done. Yeah. So I, I advocate doing this research at some point. Yeah, great. Now, <laughs> now that you are now present at the Pranapratishta ceremony in Ayodhya during this event, right? And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, uh, any reflections uh, from your side in having been actually physically present at that occasion? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> the atmosphere was, of course, overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd compare it to a rock concert except that it was real. You see, at rock concerts in the West, you know, you have this cheap, easy atmosphere of, you know, a great excitement and so on, but over nothing. Mm -hmm. And here it was about a very serious issue. You know, after, after centuries, finally, we had the return of the king. We had Rama coming back to Ayodhya. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very important occasion. Um, I... Uh, I, I mean, I greatly uh, appreciate all the people who were there. Um, uh, so a very large percentage were sadhus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there were many people who had something to do with the movement. Um, it was it was only either Indians or Indians from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, I saw only other only other white person there, namely uh, a Swami, an ordained Swami of the um, uh, the Hare Krishna movement Radhanath from Hungary. Radhanath. And yeah, there must have been a few, yeah. but so that was very marginal. Mm -hmm. So it was very much uh, a movement of native Hindus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that atmosphere of, you know, we're all in this together, we're in the same boat, you know, we've had the same experience for hundreds of years. You know, we've been robbed of our Rama in his uh, Janmabhumi site. You know, that was so strong. I mean, the joy among the people there, it was electrifying. Mm. You, I mean, you couldn't escape this, this feeling that was hanging in the atmosphere. Mm. Uh, of course, the organizers emphasized that also, like, on the great moment, you know, of the Prana Pratista, a helicopter flew over and threw out, you know, uh, uh, oh. flower petals. Oh, uh, <laughs> at any rate, that emphasized the atmosphere. A little bit later, everybody enthusiastically sang this song, um, Raghupati Raghava Rava, uh, Raja Ram. Yeah. And in the original version, not in the watered down multiculturalist version of Mahatma Gandhi but the real one and you know so this you know the way that they all laid their hearts in it you know that enthusiasm was i mean i'd never seen it before yeah yeah well, it's fantastic uh dr elst i i must say that uh you you had the extraordinary opportunity to participate uh, through uh what now more than 30 years of uh uh, you know, a movement that went through so many ups and downs and so much struggle and, uh, you know, and violence and court cases and arguments, historical arguments, archaeological evidence, Supreme Court judgments. I mean, it, it's it's an incredible uh, journey to have been on for so many years and to document and write about it in so many different, at so many different junctures of this long journey, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so I would ask you, you know, how do you uh, uh, hold this opportunity of writing about it at so many important points for over 30 plus years? Uh, how, how do you view that? And what, what do you think is the significance of this Ram Janma Bhumi return, the return of the Ram, uh, of the Ram? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you think is the significance of that? Yeah, well, when I started it, of course, I didn't know uh, where it was leading to. <clears throat> so I'm very fortunate to have lived through that movement and also see the conclusion of it. I mean, many of the people I've known, you know, that have worked for this conclusion weren't there anymore to see it. Um, so in, in this sense, I'm very fortunate. Now, um, 
let me take this opportunity first of all to thank a few people. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I've already mentioned the scholars. Now, what the scholars did was crucial to convince the court to award the site to the Hindus. However, we must also say that it was a very easy job because, mm -hmm. after all, the evidence was known. And mostly scholars of that period knew this evidence, knew where to find it, you see, knew where to look for more similar evidence. Mm -hmm. And so, you see, we spend our time in, you know, air conditioned. Well, in those days, they were not air conditioned yet. But at any rate, in, you know, in, in libraries and so on, no danger to our lives, you see. Um, whereas, you see, there's a second group I really want to thank is the people who agitated on the streets. Yeah. who risked their lives, who sometimes gave their lives. Yeah. Um, so this started with the, in 1983, with the movement for the liberation of Rama's birthplace, started by Mahant Avaidyanath, uh, a Hindu Mahasabha member of parliament and the personal guru of the present day chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath. Okay. Then to Congress people, a local politician, Daudai Al Khanna, and the ex Prime Minister, Gulzari Lal Nanda. This again shows that the image of Congress being against the temple is really not correct historically, at least up to, uh, up to um, Narasingha Rao. Congress was largely in favor of the temple. Anyway, so the year later, 18, uh, 1984, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad passed the resolution and entered the movement for Ram Jamakum. So that's when the street agitation starts. And so many of these street agitators, you know, Kar Sevax, uh, did a very important job. Of course, also risked their lives, like the Kothari brothers and, and the dozens of others who were shot by Mulayam Singh Yadav in 1990. Uh, you have also Many people who didn't seek that, who went, didn't go that far, but at least, you know, allied, you know, rallied around the side of Rama, like the pilgrims in Godra in 2002, who came back by train from Ayodhya and who were murdered, who were arsoned in the train. You know, the 59 pilgrims killed. Uh, so there are a number of physical uh, victims of the Ayodhya movement. Uh, so, I mean, their dedication absolutely deserves uh, admiration. Uh, so those people, you know, actually carried on the struggle. The rest of India, I mean, very many millions of people were in it with their hearts. And so they too felt, you know, an immense satisfaction when finally this movement was crowned with success. Um, now about the... Uh, the general significance, uh, of course, it is, a, it is a very good thing that finally Hindus scored uh, a civilization of victory. Yeah. And, you know, it, it won't easily come back. I expect the um, Kashi Vishwanath and the Krishna Janmabhumi also to revert to Hindu use, uh, hopefully not with bloodshed, I think uh, the Muslim side has mostly, not all of them, mostly learned the lesson that you see it's futile to to struggle against historical evidence. These things are easy to verify. It has just now happened regarding the Kashi Vishwanath, yeah. where of course everybody can see with his own eyes that it used to be a temple. Now. You see, yeah, everybody knew it, but now it's scientific. You know, <laughs> now there's an actual report by archaeologists. Uh, but so on the Muslim side, you see, this must create an effect of, well, you know, what are we doing? Right. And especially because these places are not important to Muslims. Yeah. I mean, there's Mecca. There is also maybe Ajmer. But so no Muslim ever goes on pilgrimage to Ayodhya or to Kashi or to Mathura. So for them, you see, it is not important, just like in the 1980s, it was, you know, not very important to them. So I think it is possible if, if nobody does anything silly, you know, it must be possible to now 
achieve this, you know, the, the, the re-Hinduization of these other two places uh, peacefully. Uh, but so, you know, they will not generate the enormous excitement that, you know, <laughs> was created uh, over the Ayodhya event, because that was the first in in centuries. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, in that sense, the, the, the template for uh, restoration is a, a, a precedent has been set with Ayodhya. And, you know, and, yes. you know, hopefully there are lots of lessons to be learned in terms of what works and what doesn't work and you know what not to do and what to do and so on so hopefully the future... but you can see it in the newspapers mm. um you know when the uh, when the babri masjid was destroyed you had this enormous moralism this enormous you know anti hindu reaction you know sharam se kaho hum hindu hain say with shame we are hindus mm. and you know today the same newspapers are all enthusiastic mm. You know, I mean, if, if you see the Times of India, you know, how it brought, you know, the, the, the thing in, you know, the Prana Pratishta news on front page in big letters, very festively, uh, you know, this this change in, in public mentality is so enormous. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, we can't claim that now everything is hunky-dory. There are still important things to achieve. Yeah. like abolishing the anti-Hindu discriminations from the text of the constitution right. or to restore all the Hindu temples that have been nationalized mm -hmm. to private Hindu ownership. Yeah. I mean, there are still important things to do, right. Uh, right. but nevertheless, there's a sea change in mentality in India. Right. And, you know, so that's, that's one of the most important things that have been achieved. Yeah. And hopefully that... Uh... Some uh, some of that change may one day come to the shores of the United States and England and Europe and, and even the Washington mm -hmm. Post and New York Times and so on might slightly change their minds about how to report on these matters. So, but that day is yet to come. <clears throat> uh, I want to conclude today, uh, you know, partly because uh, it's late for Conrad in India, partly because I have to mm -hmm. move on to another appointment. I, I want to. Uh, Dr. Konrad, deeply, deeply appreciate and thank you for your participation today. And I mean, uh, for no less, you know, you, your involvement and commitment to this issue and the way you've studied it and documented it. And I, I would recommend all the members of the audience to go back and, uh, you know, buy copies of Dr. Konrad L's uh, uh, books on this matter, you know, including the original book that he wrote on Ram Janmabhoomi and the negationism and his most recent work. I mean, probably nobody else has, um, you know, academically documented these events as rigorously and thoroughly as Dr. Konrad Elst has done. And I think that for that reason alone, uh, Dr. Elst, uh, uh, you know, uh, deserves our highest appreciation and gratitude. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Els, thank you. Thank you very much for joining. And the audience, namaste, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Please uh, do fill out the survey, and I'll leave you all in the hands of uh, Ankur Patel, okay? Ankur, over to you, please. What a wonderful okay. webinar. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Dr. Els, are you trying to say something? Your video turned off. You are saying Jay Sitaram. Oh, Jay Sitaram, I just yes. wanted to say Jay Sitaram. <laughs> Jai, Jai, Jai yeah, Jai and actually, next week on this webinar, we're going to have Shantanu Guptaji talking about uh, firsthand experience from the Ram Jamabumi and, and Pran Pratishta as well. So this is so important. We're having multiple webinars discussing this and continuing this conversation. Please join us next week. Participate in our webinars. Take a course. Get Conrad's book. Uh, support Hindu University of America, however you can. It's for all of us so that we have this shared platform so we can dig deep and do this kind of important work the restoration, the stewardship, the reclamation, uh, the dharmic work that we're on together. And it's always my pleasure. Thank you so much. What Thank a wonderful you. webinar. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. Bye-bye.